Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 34th episode of the Startup Boston podcast, where I interview entrepreneurs, investors, and influencers in the Boston startup community to uncover actionable advice and stories from their experiences. I'm your host, Nick Dupuy, and today's guest is David Delmont. Formerly, David was a design lead at PayPal and is currently the founder and executive director of Resilient Coders. Resilient Coders' mission is simple. They take students from traditionally underserved communities and teach them the skills needed to be web developers during an eight-week boot camp. Upon completing the boot camp, Resilient Coders helps connect them to job opportunities. A few things David talks about in this episode are when he first recognized the need for a program like Resilient Coders at a conference, how they designed the curriculum for the boot camp, lessons he took away from Mass Challenge, and attributes and characteristics he finds great coders possess. If you like today's episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes so you can get all of the new episodes as soon as they're released right on your podcast app. And as always, you can find today's show notes at startupbostonpodcast.com and you can reach me at nic at startupbostonpodcast.com. Enjoy today's episode. David, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you so much, Nick. I want to get into resilient coders. I also want to talk about, you know, within there, the boot camp, the lab. I also want to talk a little bit about UI, UX, and um, for people learning how to code as well. Um, but first, can you give us a little background about yourself? Yeah. So I uh, I went to art school. I went to the BU College of Fine Arts, got a degree in design. So I am at my core a designer. Plan A was to be a, a comic book illustrator once upon a time. Found my way into uh, UI dev. Totally fell in love with it. Um, worked with a handful of startups here and there, and then found myself leading a phenomenal team of designers and coders uh, at a startup that would then be acquired by PayPal. And that's where I was before leaving to start up Resilient Coders. Tell us a little bit more about Resilient Coders. Uh, so at Resilient Coders, we work with young people and early career folks from Boston. They are from traditionally underserved communities and communities underrepresented in technology. And we teach them the fundamentals of web development in order to align them with a lucrative, uh, intellectually rewarding career. So why did you start Resilient Quarters and when did you first you know, identify the need for it? Oh, man. Well, first and foremost, I was at PayPal trying desperately to hire uh, development talent. And just it was so hard. It took me like eight months to find somebody. Wow. Um, and then at the same time, I was seeing a trend that was taking over the tech community. Uh, or maybe I was just discovering an existing interesting thing about the tech community, which was its uh, homogeneity. Uh, I can pinpoint a, a particular moment when I was sent down to this tech festival, massive tech festival, and I saw all these these folks pitching these beautiful and elegant, sophisticated solutions to complete bullshit non problems. So let's figure out a way to 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 fix this minor inconvenience that we suffer. You can never again shall you have to open three browser tabs <laughs> to accomplish a task. And it occurred to me that. You know, I, I believe in technology as it, that, that should go hand in glove with social progress uh, and the advancement of our standard of life. And I mean, going all the way back, going all the way back to the wheel, to the aqueducts in Rome, to me, technology enables social progress. So where are we now? What has happened that technology has, in so many instances, been applied to just solve these small inconveniences? Like, have we, have we just completely run out of problems? Do we live in this utopian vision of of the world where we're like we're good, and now we're now we have the luxury of focusing our attention on closing some of your browser tabs. So here I am in this weird headspace at this festival, and I start listening for the language that I grew up with, and which was Spanish, and I heard none. This was a festival in Texas, no Spanish, and I started doing this little uh, social experiment, which I, I started counting people that I could visually identify as people of color. I counted essentially no one. It was like 14 people, which was nuts. I was there for days, tens of thousands of people. That's a real problem. That's an actual problem. That's not a browser tab inconvenience. That's where our best and the brightest should be dedicating their, their, their creative energy, their, their intellectual muscle. And at that moment, it seemed to me like nobody was, or rather not enough people were. Um, and I, I first tried to kind of code my way out of the situation. Like maybe I can build a piece of software that solves this problem. Uh, I, I did. I tried. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that it's not that kind of a problem. It's like a, it's a roll up your sleeves and just do it kind of a problem. 
So I started taking some vacation days from PayPal to uh, to teach. At this point, it was teach young men in lockup in a deten- in a detention facility some web development fundamentals. And I discovered something really fascinating. Besides just their interest in doing it, a lot of these guys had those things that you can't read on a resume that you need in a good technologist that you want on your team. Many of these guys were uh, they were resourceful. They were really smart. They were aggressive. Um, they were hackers in the sense that they wanted to find some way around a particular problem. And sometimes that solution was delinquent, but they were solving a problem. And I discovered this bizarre thing, which was that a lot of these young men, they were not creating problems or they were not getting into trouble despite their intellect, which I think is often the, the common conception. Rather, they were getting into trouble because of their intellect, because they were applying their intellect and their creative energy and their intellectual muscle to solving the problems that they saw on their doorstep, in their neighborhoods, in their homes. And that too often led them down this particular path. Because the fact of the matter is that if you are unsafe walking to school in the morning, if you don't have stability in your home, you are not going to care about Shakespeare. You're not going to write that paper on Napoleon. Mm -hmm you're going to focus your creative energy on solving real problems. And that's what I started discovering about this particular cohort of young men. And I realized that these guys are just a little bit of training away from being exactly what the tech community needs. A couple of questions off of that. First one, why do you think people aren't focusing on real problems and instead are focusing on, say, those browser tab problems? Second question is, why do you think it has taken so long for people to know, identify the need that you saw where you were walking around and you only saw 14 people. Why do you think it's gotten to that point and why do you think it hasn't been able to be solved yet? Oh man, these are huge questions. I love it. In terms of the first question, uh, I think that there are a few things going on here. I think that there's a fair amount of prospecting happening in the community where people have have a certain technical skill and they just want to go and just create a business, whatever it is, and just make money. I think that there are a lot of folks who find the solution first, and then they want to go out and find a problem that they can attach it to. Like they're running around with a hammer, and so they're just looking for a nail. And uh, I think that this happens a lot whenever you have sort of tech-driven companies. By tech-driven companies, I mean that you have like a founder who is uh, an engineer or you know a computer scientist on some level, and they, they've developed a technology, and then they say, what's the problem to which we may have stumbled upon the aspirin? Uh, And I I totally get that. But what ends up happening is that if we're thinking from the perspective of solutions first and then going out and finding problems, we might not get around to the problems. Um, And I think another aspect of this issue that is actually also going to lead to part two of your question is I actually think that a lot of the folks who are out there in the tech community solving these problems, they just don't face those problems. I mean, you're not necessarily going to allocate your time and resources to solving a problem that you don't feel. And so if you don't experience hunger, it might not occur to you to try to solve hunger. Even though we all on some intellectual level know that it happens, it's not a pain point that you feel personally. Mm -hmm. I think that we tend to be attracted to solutions to problems that we feel personally. Um, And I think this is a symptom of a greater ill, which is the fact that the folks who are feeling these problems don't always have a shot that's solving them. It's a two-sided problem. One, the fact that those problems are often not being addressed because those who are in a position to solve them don't feel them. And two, the fact that those people who are solving the problem don't necessarily have access to that community, right? So it's, it's the same problem articulated in two different ways, affecting different communities. And it, man, if you want to talk about why the tech community is not necessarily diverse, there's just so much to unpack there. Uh, There are a lot of folks out there that try to point to one thing or another. Oh, you know, the education system or, you know, oh, the tech community, uh, there there are racist hiring practices and blah, 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 blah. The fact of the matter is that this is a big, hairy knot. Uh, And there are a lot of different aspects that go into it. Um, I think that a lot of it is just what you grow up around. If you grow up around sort of quote unquote professional people, Mm -hmm. um, then you have an understanding that that's how life goes. You get to a certain age and then you go to your white collar job. Uh, I grew up absolutely hating school, right? But my parents uh, had a like a quote unquote professional job. My friends' parents had quote unquote professional jobs, and so my understanding was that I just needed to shut up, smile, and nod my way through high school so that I can continue on with the next inevitable phase of life. Uh, get the you know get the stupid piece of paper with which I can go on and get the more expensive stupid piece of paper, and then get on with my life. 
Now, what happens if you take me, my personality at the time, my high school personality, and you plop me into an environment where I look around me and I see my dad went through 12 years of school and he's unloading Pepsi trucks. My uncle went through 12 years of school and he's in prison. You know, my other uncle went through school and he's not doing anything. Then why the hell would I invest my time and my energy into some sort of an initiative that is 12 years in the making and yields nothing? We think of our we think of our young people as investors of time and energy. Now, I know that sounds like a cliche that you're going to put up on your classroom, right? We're all investors of time and energy. But if you think about it, let's think about what that investment is that we're asking our young people to make. Put in 12 years of your life, and maybe someday you'll see some kind of a return. Maybe. That's crazy. Who would invest their time and energy if they didn't feel secure that after 12 years, something would come of it? Would you put in all of your money and all of your time into an enterprise that you weren't pretty comfortably sure it was going to yield something? Hell no. And so what ends up happening is who are the folks that wake up in the morning, look around them, and realize the nature of this deal? It's too often, it's the smart young people. It's the intellectual people who look around them and say, why? God, that is such a dangerous question to ask. And so too many of these young people go, why? And I think that leads to a dearth of talent because so many of these of those young people go sideways and they pursue other paths that for one reason or another they think will be more lucrative uh, either intellectually or financially than continuing on with school. Tell us more about your boot camp program. Today is a big day. Today is the very first day of our current boot camp. Oh, congratulations. Oh, thank you. Uh, so boot camp is uh, it's awesome. It's eight weeks long. It's uh, it's all day, every day. Uh, we are hosted this time around by Insight Squared. We got a whole suite of new uh, Surface Pro tablets from Microsoft, and we have a cohort full of early career folks who just came in today, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, ready to get into it. Um, so what that is is that we uh, we conduct a, an informal audit with folks in, in the area that are hiring for front-end developers to get a sense for what the skills are that they need to have. Uh, we develop, build, tweak, rebuild a curriculum and a syllabus around those skills to make sure that we are in line with the needs of the market. And then we pump that into some craniums. Um, and so we have we have a staff instructor who is phenomenal. Uh, his name is Leon Knoll, and he's out there um, pouring his heart out uh, and making sure that our young people are prepared for the, for the market. So your syllabus and curriculum changes depending on what it is people are hiring for. Yeah, we've, we've chosen to center around, so this particular track right now, uh, we're focusing on front-end web development. Uh, so within front-end web development, that in and of itself is a relatively broad field, uh, and how we teach and what specifically we teach has a lot to do with what people are hiring for. We go out and we do an informal survey of what folks are hiring for. Are there any new skills that you find people are looking for that maybe you didn't see in the past? Absolutely. Uh, there's, I think that uh, there's a rise of JavaScript frameworks becoming more and more popular, including you know, Angular 2, uh, React, uh, even to a lesser degree, um, Backbone. Uh, and so we incorporate some of, those, some of that stuff into, uh, into the boot camp and also time after boot camp. What's the process like for someone who wants to take part in the boot camp? Yeah, so uh, we have a couple of boot camps um, a year. Uh, we don't yet necessarily have much on the website for the next boot camp. And of course, um, applications are closed for the current one. So what we tell everybody who wants to get involved is either email me, that's david at resilientcoders.org, or you can also just stop by what we call our community hours, uh, which is twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, between 3.30 and 6. We make ourselves available to folks at 50 Milk Street. Um, drop me a note so that I know to expect you, and we can come talk about uh, whether or not boot camp is, uh, is a good option for you. How do the students know if web development is something that would be of interest to them? Let's say if they if they had maybe some exposure to it in the past, or is it something that's completely new to them? You know, how do they know that that's something that they want to pursue? Yeah, most of our most of our folks have not had any exposure to web development in the past. What we do is we uh, so there's a couple things. First of all, we always encourage folks to come by the community hours, the Tuesday and Thursday hours, uh, to just get a sense for what it is. Um, the other thing is that we the way that we recruit into the boot camp is that we hold a series of very informal, day-long hackathons. People can come by if they're just curious, wrap their heads around what this whole web development business is all about. Uh, they can meet us, we can meet them, and we can assess whether there's a mutual fit. So we have, we have one staff instructor who leads it. I am there uh, as much as I can. I pop in and out. 
uh, and then we we open it up to uh, to mentors and volunteers who want to come by and essentially work as TAs. Uh, you can find out a little bit more about how to become a TA or a mentor if you're interested. Uh, if you just go to resilientcoders.org slash bootcamp, um, there's a little bit of information there as to how to get involved. We've actually made it pretty easy, this bootcamp, by setting up a, like a Google appointment calendar. Mm-hmm. So you can even just go in and find a slot that aligns with your skill set and with your schedule and just book it. So eight weeks of time is a relatively short period of time. So I'm interested to know what you find is you know the key to both learning and teaching these skills over this eight-week period or that short period of time. There are a couple of ways in which we make the most of that time. First of all, we bake into the curriculum an opportunity for folks to present their personal hustle. Um, so there's a lot of direct instruction. Here's a question. We expect an answer. Here's a challenge. We expect some sort of a solution to it. But then there's also challenges that are totally open-ended and folks can respond uh, with a level of granularity or with uh, style in the way in their problem solving that allows their their own personalities and their own style to shine through. And we award points. So we are, we're rigorously a point system based organization. At the end of the bootcamp, we select a certain number of individuals to continue on with us. And they join us for a three-month apprenticeship in our web development company, Resilient Lab. And so what Resilient Lab is, is that we, uh, we build websites and web applications for paying clients. And then we actually hire the, the top students out of the bootcamp to do that work with us. So it ends up being an apprenticeship and it's an apprenticeship during which those apprentices can also continue learning. So you bake in some additional learning time so that you can continue to get at those things like Angular 2, like React, mm-hmm. um, that we have only would have just touched on in boot camp. Because we do recognize that eight weeks is a, it's, I mean, that's just a very, it's a very short amount of time. This also allows us to keep throwing more challenges at those students. Do all of the, the top performers go to the lab or do some of them also get hired to other companies as well? Yep, some of them get hired directly into companies. Okay. Yep. So what are some of the companies, say, that graduates of your boot camp have gone on to work for? Uh, yep, some of our boot camp grads have gone on to companies like, uh, we actually have one at BU, Boston University. We have, we have some at smaller companies. We have one at a company called Data Collective. We have a couple who are working for uh, a consultancy down in, based out of D.C. They're working remotely. Yeah, we have a, we have a few others. We have, we have one. Uh, we have one student who just attended a community. He didn't do boot camp. He just did the community hours, and he's now working at the Gromit. Uh, we have one who did the same thing uh, who is now at the Globe. I'm interested to know if you have a like a success story that you like to tell about someone who has gone through your boot camp. Oh, man. Yeah, we, we have a few. Um, and it's hard to tell the success stories because all I can really give you is the finish line. And with a lot of these young people, if I tell you the finish line, or if I, which, you know, the finish line in this case is like they got a job working in, in technology, like, like some of these folks that I just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, and that's the finish line. And right to, to you and me and to a lot of folks who might be listening, that's not a particularly impressive finish line. But the fact of the matter is that we didn't all start at the same starting line. This is a, this is a distance race, right? That is measured not by where you ended, but where you started. Uh, and some of these, coders have overcome unbelievable challenges or they have just traversed incredible distances to get to that point where they are working as engineers. So all of the folks that I just mentioned, uh, none of them have, for example, a college degree. And yet they're working out there as engineers. And that's just one facet of their background that might present a sliver of a challenge. These folks have a way of turning their histories turning their personalities, turning their backgrounds, which in some contexts can be seen as detrimental, and owning it, owning the grit, the resilience that that has distilled out of them, and creating something amazing with it. Because you have these folks who are not just engineers, but they are also mentors to their near peers, to folks who can relate to where they came from, where that starting line was. And I think that's that's a success story. And it's a, it's hard to articulate that success story without going over all that terrain, but we're unbelievably proud of them. You brought up uh, Resilient Lab before. Mm-hmm. So tell me more about that and maybe some of the projects that you've worked on through there. Resilient Lab, again, it's, just a, it's a web design and development company that we run building websites and web applications for paying clients. And that gives us an opportunity to 
uh, employ our top students. We like to say that we don't hire coders so that we can build websites. We build websites so that we can hire coders. Uh, it is our workforce development program that allows us to ramp up some of these careers. I do want to make it clear that although these folks are relatively new in their careers, the output that they produce is professional. Everything is vetted, led, guided by a seasoned professional, either by myself or other staff that is involved in the lab. The output is professional, but it's it's kind of like it's sort of the social the social enterprise of web development, right? So just like you know how there's Tom's shoes, yeah. This is sort of a similar thing in that you're getting your pair of shoes, right? You're getting the thing that you paid for. You're getting your website, uh, and you're not. It's not like you're paying way more for it. But we have developed a model such that with your dollars, of which you are able to hire us to build a website, um, we do way more than build your website because baked into that is learning time. So these folks who are building that site and launching their careers, they are also learning. How much of the time would you say is split between, say, learning and creating? Uh, so it's it's roughly 50-50, actually. It's about 50-50 for every hour that they spent really doing billable work for a client. We also allow them to spend another hour just continuing to explore. Uh, and we pay them for that time uh, because otherwise we would be competing for another job. Like we'd be competing for, we'd be competing with like retail, right? That would pull them away from Resilient Lab to get that paycheck. Yeah. So the work that we bring in through Resilient Lab allows us to hire them a, to do the billable hours for the client, but also B, to stick around that additional hour and continue learning, continue exploring. I have a few questions I want to talk to you about UI and UX design. Mm -hmm. So the first one is, what tools or services are you most excited about to make it easier to achieve good UI and UX in applications? You know, I have a very disappointing answer for this one. I have used about a bajillion different tools mm -hmm. for, for UI and UX, but I'm, a, I'm, not, a, I'm not a tool... I'm not a tool person, if that makes any sense. Like at the, at the end of the day, I keep going back to like a sketchbook. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I guess that's it. Like I, I, I still, I'm very kind of low tech when it comes to UI UX. There are certainly like efficiency tools. I mean, there, you know, there's classic. I, I like to use Illustrator. I know that there are mm -hmm. like a bajillion. There's like Sketch and stuff you can use. That's that's way more intuitive, I guess, for UI UX. But I mean, for me, I like to start with a client either with a sketchbook or on the wall whiteboarding. Um, those have proven to be the most successful tools with which to um, to do user experience, just walking a client through um, what the experience could or should be. What would you say is the key to creating a good UI UX experience? Having an understanding of the audience, who they are, what their objectives are when using your website or your product, and what are the expectations that they bring to your product. Um, what is the experience that they expect to have so that if you deviate from that convention, you do so purposefully? So is it more of creating the user experience and then designing around that rather than designing first and then creating the experience? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I like to relay it to, to music or to movies, right? So if you watch, if you watch a rom-com, if you watch yeah. a Western, if you watch a horror film, there's a, there's a formula. Right. There's right. a very rigid formula that we are so familiar with that people are out there making videos making fun of the formula. It's so rigid that if you deviate from that formula, that's what gets noticed. User experience and being a really compelling designer is the same thing. If you go out there, if you, I mean, if you go out there and you're like, well, I'm just going to break every rule in the book because I went to art school and you just don't understand me, that's going to be kind of a shitty experience because people don't even know where to begin and they don't need, they're not going to notice your deviations. Mm -hmm. Like if you're out there to watch, if you're watching like a David Lynch movie, you're not going to notice the quirks because everything is a quirk. Now, if you're abiding by the expectations that a particular user has for how to use a product like yours, and then you throw a quirk at them, that is really compelling design because you have mastery over the formula because you were able to use it in your favor and deviate from it in a way that was purposeful, intentional. You want to be unique, but not so far unique that and different that it messes with the experience that someone is looking for. Exactly. Right. I mean, it's like it's like jazz. You can sit here and bang your forehead against the keyboard yeah. and call it jazz because it's very innovative and no one's doing anything like it, sure. But maybe, like, maybe there's like a melody, right? And you follow this sort of melody, and then when you hit a couple of notes here that are a little bit quirky, that you really notice. That's that's music. That's jazz. That really sticks out to you. If you were hiring for a UI UX candidate, how could you identify a good candidate? 
Uh, so it depends on if we're talking about UI, like if we're talking about developer or designer. Say designer. Yeah, I think that honestly the best way to do it is to just present present a problem or present a potential product idea and watch the way that they wrap their heads around how to solve the problem. This is something that we do as a, as a way of recruiting to the boot camp as well. We, I mean, when we recruit in the boot camp, we don't see how good of a coder you are. We want to get a sense for how you approach problems. So today, so this morning was the first day of our boot camp, and uh, Leon was throwing out a bunch of new, you know, here's the syllabus, here's what we're going to be doing. And uh, the, the young man who was sitting next to me was just writing down questions that he had. And then while the questions were coming up, some of them were being answered, so he was deleting them. He was modifying the questions as he heard more information. That's what we look for. Like, how is it that you approach this deluge of new information? How do you approach a problem? Are you going to kind of like bang your head against it? Are you going to sort of cut this way, cut that way, see if you can find an entrance and, and kind of maneuver around the problem? I think we all have a style. Uh, and what you want to do is just get a sense for how people think, how they approach problems, and see if it's something that's compatible with with what you need. Also, in terms of user observation, you know, do you prefer, say, in person observation, watching someone use a product, or say using tools in the background that say record, you know, clicks and time on pages and you know that sort of background observation, or is it kind of like a mix of the two? I like in person because you can have a conversation with a person. Okay. Uh, but I also don't, I think I'm probably different from a lot of my, my UX colleagues in this. I don't really take the learnings from those conversations as gospel. I think that they are a data point because the fact of the matter is that you're only going to get so far if you just, if you're completely driven by what the user thinks that they need. Um, I think it's a data point to pay attention to, but I don't think it's the end all be all. I want to talk a little bit about if someone's learning to code, but they don't know where to start, where would you point them to? Uh, so I think it totally depends on what the objective of this person's learning to code is. Right? So there are some people who are like, I want to start a business. I, I'm going to learn to code. I would say absolutely not. Like the time it would take you to learn how to code well enough so that you can start the business would yeah. just push you right out of that market. If you want to learn to code because you want to get a job, that's also different than if you want to learn to code because you just, you're a hobbyist and you're interested in, say, gaming. Or if you want to learn to code because there's a particular set of technology that's interesting to you. Maybe you're just a really big, like, VR nerd and you want to jump on the VR bandwagon, cool. That's that's a totally different reason for which to learn to code. And so I would point you in a different direction. We like to just bring people here into 50 Milk and just talk to them about what it is that they want to do and see if we can set them on a path that makes sense for what they want to do. You went through Mass Challenge, is that correct? Yeah, we did. So why did you decide to take part in Mass Challenge? We had some blind spots. There are a lot of things that we weren't very good at at that point that we just needed uh, some help with. And Mass Challenge is really good at um, connecting you with folks who have answers to which you didn't even know you had questions. And that was absolutely critical for us. The case for me, and probably the case for most entrepreneurs out there, I would say, is that the smartest thing you can do is is recognize what you absolutely suck at. And just be, be honest with it. Find people who are really good at what you suck at. Hire them if you can. Uh, pull them on as advisors or mentors if you can. And that's exactly what I pulled out of Mass Challenge. I identified what the things were that I was worst at. And I was able to pull together a group of mentors who provided uh, really seriously awesome support uh, in those particular aspects of the business. What were some of the things that you identified? You know, I whittled it down to one thing. <laughs> there's, there's a whole lot that I suck at. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing that I sucked the most at was how, how do we go about telling our story in such a way that it is in line with what X funder wants to fund. I say X funder because I also wasn't entirely clear as to who our ideal funder would be. And so I needed to understand the profile of who that was. Uh, I needed to understand what it was that they were looking for when joining a mission and how to appeal to those folks. And so I, I met some folks who were uh, able to give us some invaluable insight on that stuff. If someone listening is interested in, say, taking part in an accelerator program, what would you tell them? Oh man, I would tell them to go in with eyes wide open. Your time as an entrepreneur is incredibly valuable and there's nothing worse than investing a lot of time in something and not getting something in return. I would say that there are a lot of opportunities out there, whether they are accelerators or whatever they are, where they demand a lot of time and they might not necessarily yield the appropriate return that you need for it to be worth it. And so I would just do a lot of homework about what it is explicitly, specifically, 
that you need to get out of that experience and whether or not the opportunity that you're applying to can realistically deliver those results. And if they can't, if you're just blindly applying this stuff because either you're like, well, it can't be bad or because there's a certain amount of prestige that you associate with it, don't do it because if it's not worth your time, it's just going to kill you. Um, that might be a little bit extreme, but it's gonna it's just not going to be a great experience. Yeah. Um, so be super intentional about where you engage your time. There was actually a point in our time when I was tracking how many hours a week I spent on each different initiative just so I could be aware of what the most resource-intensive and therefore expensive initiatives were that we were participating in. And I want to move into our rapid-fire questions. So the first question is, what's another startup in Boston that you're most excited about? Art Lifting. They're awesome. Do you know them? I, I've heard of them. I know a little bit. Liz Powers, right? Is the yeah, Liz founder. Powers. I yeah. think she was just named 30 Under 30. Wow. She's a badass. Yeah. Yeah. What's something about you that most people don't know? Probably the fact that I, um, that I grew up on a Spanish-speaking home and uh, learn to speak English watching Sesame Street. <laughs> nice. What advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? Shut up and listen. I didn't do enough of that when I was younger. I was too busy uh, running my mouth and, and uh, trying to be the smartest person in the room. Outside of work, what do you look forward to the most? Uh, definitely spending time with my wife and uh, making a little bit of time to be outside and, and run. What are some of your favorite tools that help make your life and work easier? Definitely. I use, I use a task list software called uh, Red Booth. It's awesome. Uh, I don't know anybody else that uses it. Red Booth? Red Booth. Okay. But it's just incredibly simple and intuitive. We use Trello, and I think I, sp I just spend a ton of my time. Oh, HubSpot. Uh, and I spend a ton of my time on, uh, on those, those tools. They, they definitely save me a lot of time. Do you have any favorite blogs or books? I don't really read a lot of blogs anymore. I definitely read a lot of books, and I, I always have like a new list of favorites. I actually just finished uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates' new book, um, Between the World and Me. Ah, uh, yes, that's on my list. It's, oh, man, yes. it's required. But I actually, I will say to folks who read Between the World and Me, I would say also read Strangers in Their Own Land. Okay. Um, which essentially, it's the story of like, if they're trying to um, get into the, the mentality of the, the disenfranchised right in this country. Um, so I, I mean, I like to read books that kind of conflict with each other on some level. And so I read those two back to back. Just a few final questions here to close out. Mm -hmm. Where can people find out more about Resilient Coders? ResilientCoders.org. And where can people connect with you online? David at ResilientCoders.org. I mean, I'm also on Twitter. Um, actually, that's probably the best. So there's my email, which is David at ResilientCoders.org. Um, my personal Twitter handle is Delmar Santillas, uh, D-E-L-M-A-R-S-E-N-T-I-E-S. -E -E and then, of course, Resilient Coders. And lastly, do you have any parting thoughts, advice, or suggestions for the audience? Get good sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the, a common theme that I end up uh, saying to folks who are thinking about starting a business. First, before you do anything, please read um, The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. Please read it. Please make lots of notes in it because there are a lot of folks. I've talked to so many people who start a business with just piles and piles of assumptions that they never bother to validate. Please validate your assumptions first with a small batch before uh, quitting your job. <laughs> All right, David, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been a thank real you, pleasure. Nick. Likewise. If you liked today's episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. You'll get all my new episodes as soon as they're released right on your podcast app. And if you really liked today's episode, it would mean a lot to me if you could write a review of the podcast as well. Just go to startupbostonpodcast.com slash iTunes. And remember, you can find all show notes with links at startupbostonpodcast.com. Until next time, if you have any feedback, ideas for guests, or just want to say hi, you can reach me at nic at startupbostonpodcast.com or reach out on Twitter at startupboscast. That's startup B-O-S cast. Cheers. Cheers.